All right, so I'm going to uh, introduce Lauren Friedman, who is joining us today from the Area Agency on Aging on a topic that I think is quite important. And one of the things that before most of you joined, um, Roz was telling me that for herself, this is a topic that she feels is so important because she's on so many different medications that you want to make sure they all work together. Um, and that you're not over medicating or misusing it, not because you wanted to, but because of a mistake. So um, Lauren today is going, she's, she's been uh, working on the last seven years, providing education um, specifically on prevention and medication misuse, abuse, suicide prevention. Uh, she's a certified mental health first aid trainer and a safe talk trainer. And actually I took a, not with area agency, but I did take a, suicide prevention, which they call suicide first aid as well. Um, I forgot which agency trained me, but I know that these are very important um, trainings for even, it could be family members. It, it, for me, it worked out uh, in my different roles, but I think I thought it was so valuable. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today, Lauren, and for presenting. Um, and if you do have questions, Lauren said that uh, throughout her presentation, there's opportunities to ask. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute everyone now. Lauren, you'll just unmute and you can present. Okay. So again, thank you. Thank you all for joining. All right, unmute. Perfect. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to join this conversation. So up here on my screen, I have the presentation that I'm going to be going through today. I also have handouts that I'm going to be showing in my camera. And these handouts can be made available um, either through email or if you call, um, we can send you these handouts. So if you are interested in any of the handouts or think they would be valuable, then please um, let me know. I will definitely provide our phone number that you can call and then also again, some of these can be emailed. So today I'm going to be talking about RX matters. And for the purpose of this presentation, RX is standing for prescription medication. We won't just talk about prescription medication, but the focus of the presentation specifically with our opioid epidemic is going to be prescription medication. Um, as Levi said, I am with the Area Agency on Aging Region 1. I hope you've heard of us, but if you have not, we are an agency in Maricopa County, and there's an area agency actually in all 50 states. So at least one area agency is in every state, and Region 1, we cover all of Maricopa County. This presentation is also brought to you by the MEBAC Coalition, and MEBAC is a coalition that is funded through Mercy Care. And we also conjuncted this presentation um, with the Arizona High, Dra High Drug Trafficking um, Institute. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So with medications, there's really a twofold with medications. And if anybody would like to share, I'm going to ask a question to the group. If anyone would like to share, um, go ahead and unmute yourself, and I'd love to hear some of your ideas and things related to this question. But medications are designed because they help people to live longer, and they can help improve a person's quality of life. So does anyone have some examples of how medications can help people to live longer or improve a person's quality of life? Anyone have any ideas? Don't be shy. For those of you out there that are taking medications, if you don't mind sharing maybe what kinds of medications you're taking. Yeah, I, hello, hi, I, hi. can you hear me? I'm yeah. Robin, I, I'm a diabetic too, so I take uh, metformin. Okay. Um, and um, I take the time release because I had problems with that, um, the regular, metformin without the time release. Once I got on the time release, uh, it was much better for my stomach. And then I'm on glipicide and um, on, um, a couple others. I'd have to go look and see what they are, but okay. yeah. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate you sharing. 
So diabetes, could you imagine if we had diabetes and we didn't have insulin or medication for diabetes? So that's an excellent example. Would anyone else like to share something um, they're taking a medication for? Well, I'm Phyllis Robinson. Hi, Phyllis. Hi. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, I have atrial uh, fibrillation. Uh, I have a pacemaker, and I have to take Xarelto because, and thank goodness, that's a blood thinner. Yeah. Because it decreases my chance of stroke. If it wasn't available, uh, I think it would go up by a pretty high percentage. Um, right. So. Thank you. Appreciate you're that. welcome. Anyone else want to share? Well, I have okay. hypertension and I take medicine to keep my blood pressure in range. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, blood pressure, decreasing blood pressure. Um, there's a lot of examples that we could come up with um, for medications that we might be taking, how they can improve a person's quality of life. But there is a twofold with this. We have to be careful because if medications are misused or abused, then they can cause problems. And I'm sure that we've all heard of the opioid epidemic and just the epidemic, not just in our nation, but worldwide about what's going on specifically with medications. So on this slide, this is just depicting that more people are dying daily from overdose of medication than they are from car accidents. And in Arizona, the Arizona Department of Health Services, they actually share a statistic every Monday. They update their website every Monday. And it actually states how many people have overdosed and have died from a opioid overdose. So that current statistic in Arizona is about four Arizonans every day. Now this is across the lifespan. This is not just talking about older adults, but four people every day in our state are dying from medication overdose. So this is a very serious problem. And like I said earlier, I'm sure we all know that and we're all informed of that but sometimes hearing it in that way kind of causes us to really think this is really a problem. So how we take our medication, understanding what we're taking, why we're taking medications. If you are prescribed an opioid or something that has the potential for uh, a, a dependency or an addiction, you know, really talking to your provider and really understanding why you're taking this and understanding the dosage is very important. So I want to be clear on understanding what misuse of medication is versus abuse of medication. So if anyone wants to unmute themselves, what would be an example of misuse or abuse of medication? Does anyone have any thoughts of what that could be? What would be an example of misuse of medication? Narcotics. <clears throat> Oh, I heard narcotics. Yeah, so narcotics or opioids could be misused, okay? Does anyone have an example of what that might look like? Have taking you heard anything? More, taking more than prescribed by the doctor. Very good. Taking and more than prescribed. Also, some people who become addicted go from doctor to doctor to write new prescriptions. Yes, and we'll talk about doctor shopping as well. Perfect examples. Anyone else want to share before I start going through the answers? Uh, well, taking somebody else's medicine. Taking someone else's medicine, absolutely. And we're going to talk about that as well. I also think talking to your pharmacist about the interaction with different medications. Yes, and absolutely. When I go to the doctor, I, I bring a list of drugs with me that I take because high blood pressure, mostly high blood pressure. But I just heard somebody say Prolia, which I've been on for years, and I never think of that as a medication. I just, I go twice a year for a shot. I never thought to tell all my doctors that I'm on Prolia. Thank you for that example. And, and we're going to talk about that too, but letting your doctors know everything that you take, whether it's prescribed, over-the-counter, vitamins, supplements, 
a twice a year injection. Thank you for that example. And I did see a couple comments in the chat box. I'm trying to check that every once in a while. So thank you, Judy and Nettie, um, for sharing your examples on my previous question. Um, but yes, telling your doctor, your provider, everything that you take is very important. So now I'm gonna go through um, what misuse and abuse look like specifically. So a couple of these were, were mentioned. So misuse is taking more than prescribed. Generally speaking with older adults, we're not seeing intentional misuse. We're seeing more of the unintentional misuse, meaning that they are not trying to intentionally misuse their medication. It could be an example of something like they took their medication, they forgot that they took it, so they take it again. That would be an example of unintentional misuse. If you're taking someone else's medicine, very important that if that medicine has your name on the bottle, that you are the only person that's taking that medicine. And I'll talk more about that a little later. If you're stopping or starting your medication or mixing medication without consulting a doctor or a pharmacist, this specific bullet point here, I'll give an example. So for, um, if, if you're prescribed an antibiotic, usually an antibiotic is a seven to 10 day window to take the medication. If you decide on day three, day four, that you're feeling better, you don't wanna take the medication anymore and you stop taking it, that could, be a, that could be a misuse because you're not taking it for the intended 10 day purpose. With antibiotics specifically, you do need to take the medicine for that whole time so that the infection goes away. Um, so sometimes we tend to self-diagnose on some of those kinds of things. And so not talking to a doctor or a pharmacist and just stopping your medication is really important to not do that. Also, if you're taking medicine with alcohol when it is contraindicated, um, I always tell people, I, I have uncles and I have a dad who they take blood pressure medication and things like that. They decide they wanna have a drink that may interfere with their medication. Sometimes I've even heard too of people choosing to have a drink or two instead of taking their medication. That is also misuse because you are no longer taking the medicine as prescribed. And then also stockpiling I'm sorry or to, saving. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, when you're not supposed to take it with um, alcohol, what are the ramifications if you do? Does so it not work? Or? Alcohol is a depressant. So depending on the medication that you're taking, it can actually um, either completely counter out the medication. Um, it could double up the dose or make the dose of medication more severe. It just depends on the medication. It depends on the alcohol that's being consumed. But I always just tell people that if you are gonna have alcohol and if you're taking medication, that you just check with your doctor to make sure that there isn't a possibility for an interaction happening. And the pharmacist could tell you that too. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So with stockpiling or saving medication for later use, we're gonna talk about how to properly dispose in this presentation, but with medication, if you are no longer using a medication or if a medication has expired, it is recommended that you dispose of that medication. Um, so that would be a sign of misuse if you are hanging on to medication that you no longer use or need. So let's go ahead and talk about abuse. So you're starting to use your pain medication to feel better and not just to ease the pain. Specifically with this example, um, older adults, if they're prescribed an opioid, if they have any kind of emotional pain, such as loneliness, isolation, grief, loss, sometimes taking an opioid medication, and I'm just using an example, sometimes using an opioid can fill a void for that emotional pain. And so if that's starting to occur, that could be a sign of abuse. Also, if you're thinking about increasing your dose that your doctor has not recommended that you do so, um, if you're spending more and more time thinking about how to get the medication, so as someone mentioned earlier, the idea of doctor shopping, so going from doctor to doctor, place to place, looking for the same prescription or the same medication, that would be indicative of abuse. 
And then you've lost interest in non-drug pain management options. So not either talking or thinking about what are other kinds of modalities that can be used to relieve pain other than using an opioid. Um, so these are just the differences between misuse and abuse. So I hope that that helps to clarify as we go through our presentation. Some other risks that I wanna talk about with misuse and abuse is that increased sorry risk- I'm oh, sorry to interrupt, but what are the other modalities for decreasing pain? Sure, that's a great question. So exercise, physical therapy, acupuncture, massage therapy, just being more active, watching what we eat, um, what we put in our bodies as far as food, making sure you're drinking, drinking enough water. Um, all of that is really, really important when it comes to uh, pain management. Certainly there are gonna be things that work better for others. Um, so it really just depends on your body and, and what you're willing to try. I've also heard that mindfulness meditation, so really being you know, mindful and, and really thinking about the pain from that standpoint can be really helpful. Um, there, there's a lot of different things out there that can be helpful. And that also can be a conversation that you have with the doctor as well. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you so much for your questions. I really appreciate it. So as I was talking about increased risk of disorientation, confusion, and dizziness, which can lead to falls and injury, I tell people that if you feel disoriented, confused, dizziness, that you do let your doctor know. It could be something as simple as the dosage on a medication is too high or too low, there could be some um, medication interactions that are going on. And you really wanna be careful because that can lead to falls and injury. And unfortunately a fall or an, or an injury can be debilitating, especially as an older adult. So I definitely would encourage that if you're feeling those things, that, that you definitely let your doctor or pharmacist know. It can also impact your mood and relationships. Does anyone have a thought as to why medication misuse or abuse could impact your mood or relationships? Does anyone have an idea on that? Well, some of the medications make you sleepy. Okay. So you don't want to get up and do anything. Okay. So yeah, lack of motivation. Certainly that can be frustrating depending on the relationship you have with somebody. Um, certainly that can be frustrating. Thank you. Did I hear someone else? No. Okay. So that's a really good um, example. Also too, medications, depending on the medication can actually alter brain chemistry. So depending on the medication and depending on the person, medications can actually cause that shift and things like irritability, anger, frustration, those things can start coming out. So if you're noticing that within yourself or a loved one, you're noticing that their mood has changed and you're trying to pinpoint what's going on, why is their mood changing? It could be a medication misuse or abuse. So that's something that not a lot of people think about or they talk about, but that can impact mood and relationships. It's really difficult to have a relationship with somebody who's always argumentative and moody and irritable. And then also it can make you feel more ill to, to misuse or abuse your medication. And that can overall just lead to a decrease in independence. And I don't know anybody that wants to have a decrease in independence. So something to keep in mind is that abusing and misusing prescription drugs can be just as dangerous, addictive, or even as deadly as using street drugs. And I'm gonna talk about what that specifically means. But just know when we talk about opioids, opioids can be very addictive. Now, I don't wanna scare anybody when I say that, I just want you to be informed and I want you to know that opioids can be very addictive. So if you are taking them or, or if you are ever prescribed one, it's just very important that you really understand what you're taking. So a lot of times when I do this presentation, I get asked, what is an opioid? You may not know what that term is or equate it to a certain kind of medication. 
So I want to just clarify on this slide, and you probably, as I pull this up, you probably have heard of a lot of these medications. But legally prescribed opioids, so here are some examples I'm going to share. So Vicodin or hydrocodone, oxycotton or oxycodone, Percocet, which is oxycodone and acetaminophen, Opana or oxymorphone, methadone, and fentanyl. So I'm, I'm certain that you probably have heard of some of these, if not all. But when I talk about an opioid, this is what we're talking about. These are the kinds of medications that are being prescribed. And when we talk about an opioid, an opioid is generally prescribed for pain relief. So if you've ever been prescribed any of these medications, that's probably what the intent was for. Um, when I talk, or when I mentioned fentanyl, fentanyl is a legally prescribed opioid it is also illegally manufactured. So there are two different types of fentanyl. And fentanyl is very potent. It's actually said to be more potent than heroin. And as you see at the bottom here, our illegal opioid that I'm mentioning here is heroin. Because all of these medications that are listed here, they all come from the same class family. They are all a derivative of the poppy plant, the opium poppy plant. So when we talk about these medications, they're, they're very powerful, but they do relieve pain. And so that is something just to be aware of is when we talk about these, just know that they are very powerful medications. Any questions on this before I move on? Other high-risk substances that I want to talk about, benzodiazepines. These medications are commonly prescribed for anxiety, sleep disorders, um, epilepsy, or neurological disorders. And you probably have heard of these too. So we have Valium, Xanax, Ativan, and Klonopin. When combined with an opioid, it can cause an overdose. And I actually had a client that I met with who was in the hospital he was prescribed a benzodiazepine in the hospital. He was taking an opioid and he had an overdose. And nobody told him that there was a cause of, of overdose if you combine those medications. So that's something that if you are taking a benzodiazepine and an opioid comes on board, really want to ask those questions and really understand what you're taking. Alcohol, we've talked a little bit about alcohol. It's a generally socially accepted substance. However, as we age, alcohol has a stronger effect on our body. What we could drink when we were younger may not be what we can drink when we're older. Metabolism slows down as we age. Alcohol is processed differently. So those are all things to keep in mind as well. And just another point, all medication can be poisoned if it's taken in the wrong combination or in the wrong amount. And that's not just talking about prescription medication, that's vitamins, that's supplements, over the counters, and, and those things as well. So very important that we know what we're taking, why we're taking it, and if we have those concerns or questions that we talk to our doctor or our pharmacist. There we go. So just to give you an idea of availability, now this slide definitely looks different now because there have been some legislation and laws that have been passed since this time. But just to give you an idea of how available opioid medications are, 431 million opioid pills were prescribed in 2016. That's enough medication for every man, woman, and child to be medicated around the clock for a two week span. That's a lot of medication. And 40% of, of adults in Arizona know someone who's addicted to prescription medication. And I've even heard that that 40% is underreported. So it could even be as high as half. Half of us know at least one person who may be addicted to prescription medication. So why we talk about this slide and why this is so important is we have to be vigilant about where we have our medication, if people have access to our medication, if we're taking these kinds of medications, very important 
where we store those medications. So how many of you in here, and I can only see a few of you on my screen right now, but for those of you that are on, on Zoom, just raise your hand if you have grandchildren or great-grandchildren or pets. We'll, we'll put pets in there too. And I'm raising my hand because I have a child and I have a pet. Okay, so a lot of you, I saw some of you raise your hands. So every minute of every day, poison control centers get a call about a child getting into medicine. Every eight minutes, a child is treated in the emergency department. Three out of four of those cases involved a parent or a grandparent's medication. So where we're storing our medication is very vital. This also talk, it needs to mention pets too, because if we have pets living in our home, they can also have access to our medication. I know for me personally, I have a dog. She somehow got into a bottle of ibuprofen. I left it out in a place where I shouldn't have left it and she could have died. And so I use that story because I want to relate to people that putting your medication in a place where children, pets, people that are most vulnerable that can have access to this medication, they, they can be at risk. So where we store is important. And we're gonna talk about where to store in this presentation. So now that I've given you, you know, data and I've talked to you about how serious this problem is, the good thing is, is that we have a lot of things that we can do to help with, with knowing our medications and, and really being our own advocates. First and foremost, we have to ask questions. We have to ask questions to be informed, to know what we're taking. Become your own medication manager. Making wise choices. Remember to take your medication. Take your medication exactly as prescribed and avoid dangerous interactions. So if we know that alcohol is gonna counteract with something we're taking, we need to be aware of that. Um, if we have an over-the-counter medication that may not do well with a prescription medication, we may not wanna take both of those medications. The pharmacist is really gonna be your greatest ally when it comes to looking at potential interactions for, for medication. And I'll give you some resources for that as well. Also how we track, store and dispose of our medication is crucially important. So some things to keep in mind. All right, I wanna see more hands and screens for those of you that have Zoom. How many of you have a current and updated list of your medications? Awesome, fantastic. So if you do, bravo to you, what I would say is that make sure that that list is current and updated. Make sure that the dosage is correct, the doctor that's prescribed it is correct, any vitamins that you're taking, anything that changes, just make sure that you have that current and updated list. For those of us that don't, that's fine. But what I would recommend is that you create a list. And here at the agency, I'm gonna show you my first little handout here. Can I ask you, to the quick, I'm sorry to interrupt. Why do, you, why do you need to have the doctor that prescribes the medication on your list? Great question. So for some of us, we may have specialists, doctors, um, more than just a primary care physician. If you only have one doctor, you may not need to specify which doctor that you um, got the medication from. But for some of us, we have specialists, we have many doctors. And so just to make sure that everyone knows who prescribed what, and also for you to know as well, it can just help to make sure that we are really clear and understanding what medications that we're taking and who prescribed. So does that answer your question? Okay, so this right here, I'm gonna show you in my screen. This is keeping track of your medications. This is a log that we have as one of those resources here at the agency. And this one is pretty specific and it's gonna be hard to see, I apologize, but I'll do the best I can. But up here, you can see name of medicine, the date started, also clarifying what kind of medication is it? Is it a pill? Is it a capsule? Is it a tablet? Is it white? Is it yellow? Is it green? For some of us that take a lot of medications every day, if you take four small little white pills, it can be very easy to 
not understand what those medications are and increase the risk of misuse. Also writing the dose, when to take it, so what time of day and the reason for taking it. And then also any special instructions. So do you have to avoid certain kinds of you know, food or do you have to take the medication with food or without food? And then the doctor here on the side. So this is a pretty in-depth um, list here, but I say, especially if you're somebody that takes a lot of different medications a day, I would say the more detail you have, the better. And it's really important that you keep a list with you on your person. So your pocket, your wallet, your purse, somewhere that's easily accessible. And then also put something like this on your refrigerator at home. Paramedics are actually trained to look on refrigerators in, in homes to see if there's any medical information that can be helpful. So I would put a list for you on your fridge and for anyone that's living in your home. So having two lists is gonna be really important. If you don't wanna write out a list, um, you can always ask your doctor or your pharmacist, probably pharmacist for those of us that have a lot of different doctors, your pharmacist should have a compiled list of everything. So you can ask for a printout as well and you can put that on your fridge or keep it with you. But again, make sure that you write down everything that you're taking, including over-the-counters, vitamin supplements, and so on. Also, I wanna talk about the pharmacist because the pharmacist is really gonna be our greatest ally when it comes to taking our medications correctly. They're the ones that know the most about medications. They're the ones that go to school for a really long time for medication. So we really wanna use our pharmacist when it comes to asking questions. Another handout that I have here, it's Rx Matters, questions to ask about your medications. So there's some really good questions here to ask at the doctor's office. And then on the back here, these are some questions that you can ask at the pharmacy. So for those of us that are on the phone or maybe didn't see when I lifted it up, some sample questions. What is this medication and what is it supposed to do? How do I take the medicine and what do I watch out for? How long should I take this medication for? And another really good question, where can I get more information about this drug or getting it at a lower cost? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some cost saving options, um, but really good questions to be able to ask. And then also when you go to the doctor, asking questions and writing things down is really, really important. So some questions that might be helpful, why am I being prescribed this medication? What is it supposed to do? I can't tell you how many times that I talked to a senior and they're taking 10 medications and they have no idea what most of them do. So really, really important that you know what you're taking and why you're taking it. Also, what are the side effects? A lot of times too, we don't know what side effects there are. There might be a side effect that we, we need to know about. So for example, if you're taking an opioid medication, a very common side effect is constipation. And that's something that you're gonna to wanna to know if you're taking an opioid, constipation is no fun. So you, those are the kinds of things that we need to know and need to ask about when we go to the doctor and when we talk to our pharmacist. Um, also, if any of you have ever heard of this before or if you haven't, there's actually something called the brown bag review. And a brown bag review is actually where a pharmacist can review your medications with you. This is a free service. I have talked to a lot of pharmacists and they say that people don't know about this service and they want people to come in, bring your medications in a brown bag and have the, the pharmacist go through them with you. Bring everything that you take, your, your, your supplements, your vitamins, over-the-counters, prescribed medicine. They will sit with you and they will go through to see are there any interactions that are happening. They're gonna look at what you're taking and see, is there anything that you maybe don't need to take anymore? Because sometimes what happens is we get prescribed something, maybe it was meant to be for a short period of time, but we're taking it six months later. Those kinds of things they can take a look at. And that's gonna be great too, because maybe that will cut the number of medications that you have to take down. So brown bag review, please talk to your pharmacist 
and see if that's something they can do for you so that you can see too um, if what you're taking is really what you need to be taking. Are there any questions or comments about what I've said so far? Just wanna make sure that I'm not missing anybody. Any questions? Okay. Not a shy crowd, they'll speak up. Awesome. Also, for those of us that may be purchasing medication online, so if you don't have a pharmacy that maybe you go to, you still can talk to a pharmacist and it's important that you ask questions to your pharmacist. There is somebody that, they, that can speak to you. Um, also, if you have a lot of medications that you're taking, a lot of medications that maybe have to be taken at different times throughout the day, there are pharmacies that are now doing what's called adherence packaging. And if you haven't seen it, it comes in a box and the, the packs actually come out and it tells you on the top the, the day, it tells you the time of day and it tells you what's in the pack. So like I said, a lot of pharmacies are starting to do this. Um, I've even heard too that some insurance companies are starting to cover this service. So those are questions that you would need to ask your pharmacy and also your insurance to see if it's covered. But if you haven't heard of this, it's, it really can be helpful, especially if you're a caregiver and you're trying to manage someone else's medicine, or if you yourself have a lot of medications that you're taking, this helps reduce the risk of unintentional misuse as well. So adherence packaging is something else I would take a look at if that's something that could help you. And then also just a buyer beware if you're purchasing medicine outside of the country, um, just know, just do your research, you know, make sure you know what you're getting because unfortunately a lot of times you may think you're getting one thing and you're getting something else. So just, just do your research and, and really um, make sure you know what you're getting if you do purchase outside of the United States. I have another More question. Yes, something. go ahead. Okay. Uh, a couple of things. That package you were talking about, we have it in Canada. It's called this pill. And all the pills are actually cut up. And for you, you have them the morning, the noon, the night, awesome. and everything. You know? Yeah, it, it is awesome. It Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Another question. Another yes. question. Was. <clears throat> I'm taking medication that my doctor tells me you can't have grapefruit with that, with this medication, because it makes it null and void. My pharmacist tells me, he says, you can have your, your grapefruit two hours after you take it. Mm. Who's right? <laughs> I need a third opinion. Yeah, you know, I'm not a medical professional, so I, I will not wager my opinion. I mean, all I would say is, you know, you could talk to your doctor and see if, if I'm what going with the pharmacist. Yeah, or the pharmacist. I I'm going with those, the pharmacist. Yeah, I have heard that um, you do need to avoid grapefruit for certain kinds of medications. But yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, do what do what's going to be best for you. Um, that's yeah. that's what I'll say. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm another sorry other I question? missed some of your lecture. I'm sorry I missed some of your lectures. My internet went off. You know, oh. but 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 I'll check out I'll check out the the uh, the reviews after. Thank you so much. You're welcome, and thank you for your questions. Yeah. I have a, I have another question. Yeah. Um, I'm I take something. It's called Reclast. It's a for osteoporosis and it's an uh, in, um, infusion that I get at my um, doctor's office, but I'm aware that you're only supposed to take it for a certain number of years. Can I ask, I know I can ask the doctor that question. Can I ask a pharmacist that question? Yeah, absolutely. They may defer you to the doctor, but yeah, I would absolutely talk to the pharmacist. <laughs> Thank the pharmacist is, is just another expert. It's another ally that you can rely on and, and ask those questions to. So yeah, I would definitely talk to both of them. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So a lot of times too, when I do this presentation, I get asked, you know, what can you do when you can't afford your medication? Because as we know, medication can be very costly. There are some medications 
that are very expensive. So just some tips and things that we want to point out. So take a look at prescription discount cards. So a lot of the pharmacies nowadays are going to have some sort of a discount card program or something that you can be involved with. So ask to see if that's something that you can take advantage of if you haven't already. Also, is there a coupon for your medication? That's one of those things you don't know unless you ask. Also, GoodRx, if you have never heard of GoodRx, this is a really good resource. If you have a smartphone, you can download the app. It's a black and yellow app, and it has Rx on it. If you don't have a smartphone, you can go to the website goodrx.com. On the app and on the website, you type in the name of the medication, you type in your zip code, and it will actually pull up for you what pharmacies have that medication and at what cost. And I can't tell you how many times people have pulled this up and there's a pharmacy that's right down the street from them that has the medicine at a cheaper cost. So that's another way that if you're looking for um, ways to save money on medication, GoodRx can be a really good resource. Also pharmaceutical companies have patient assistant programs. So if you are taking a medication for you know, a chronic condition or illness or something that you're going to be taking for a long time, I would talk to the pharmaceutical company and see what their patient assistant program looks like and if that can help you with saving any um, kind of money. Also, check with Medicare. You can apply for extra help or supplemental insurance. Here at the bottom of the screen, we have our 24-hour senior helpline at the area agency. This is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week hotline. We have an amazing benefits assistance department. So when you call that number, if you have questions about Medicare, you can actually talk to somebody on the phone about your benefits and they can talk to you to see if there's anything else you qualify for or just to help you with understanding that. So that number, for those of you on the phone, um, the phone number is 602-264-4300. And again, it's a 24 hour, seven day a week service, not just for benefits, you can call for resources on pretty much anything. And um, if we don't have the resource in house, we will refer you to somebody that does. Um, also ask for samples. I've heard that samples may not be an easy thing to come by anymore. So that may or may not be an option, but sometimes a sample, if they have it, can really help you to just get through a couple of days or something like that. It would really just be a temporary solution. So these are just some things that we would recommend or suggest to help with affording medication. Lord. And then also if you're starting a new medication, um, taking a look at samples as well. Lauren. Yes. I wanted to show you my, my uh, cell phone. I got all my medications in here. Oh, okay. Good. I think that's perfect. That's a good thing. Yes. Hope it helps and also somebody. for those of you that have med alert bracelets um, or the necklace, that also is going to have medication information as well. Uh, Another, problem, oh, go ahead. The problem with having it in your phone, if you're in a car accident or you're unconscious and can't access it, the, the paramedics don't know where it is. So you should have it written with yeah. on a piece of paper behind your driver's license and your insurance cards, because that's what they're going to look for. I was on a campaign. I worked in a hospital. I'd ask people, what are your medications? They didn't know. I was on a campaign. Every patient, do you have a written list in your wallet that's easy accessible for emergency people? Because when they look at that, when the emergency room doctor looks at that medication list, he knows you have high blood pressure, you have diabetes, you're on, you have Parkinson's. He already knows your diet and your history. So Very good point. Thank you so much for bringing that up. So yes, having it on your phone can be one resource, but writing it down, like I talked about earlier, having a list with you on your person um, really is, is going to be helpful too. So thank you for sharing. Um, so we probably have all heard of the Poison Helpline or Poison Control Center, but did you know that they have resources to help you with medication? So for example, if you miss a dose, if you take too much, 
if you take the wrong medication or if you just have questions about your medication, um, the poison line can really be a helpful tool. And the number right here, the 1-800-222-1222, that's the number that you can call. And it's just another resource to have on hand. Sometimes we may be waiting for a call back from our doctor, and sometimes that may take a while. Or if it's a situation where we kind of need to know quickly, this phone number is really going to be helpful and really can give good information. You can choose to remain anonymous, but they will ask you for your name just so that they can call you back to, to check on you and make sure how you're doing. So again, another resource that's really helpful um, if you didn't know that this service existed in our community. And then also, the, this poison helpline, they actually created an opioid <laughs> line specifically. So if you have questions about opioids, it's called the OAR or line. And that number for anyone that is interested is 1-888-688-4222. So 1-888-688-4222. And everyone who answers these lines, um, they are medical professionals. So just know that when you call, that they are um, medical professionals that are gonna be able to answer those questions for you. So as I talked about earlier, um, making sure that medications that are prescribed for you are meant just for you. So we call this sharing isn't caring when it comes to medication. Your medications are just for you. It's really important that we don't share our medications because we don't know what the person's taken. We don't know if they ha they'll have an allergic reaction to something. We just don't wanna put ourselves in any kind of liability and actually, it is illegal for you to share a prescribed medication unless you are a legal prescriber. So you just don't want to be held liable. You, you know, we don't want to get into a situation where you give someone something because you think it's, you know, a kind thing to do. And unfortunately, they get sick or something happens. So we just don't want to put ourselves in that situation. So again, any medication, especially prescribed medication, we don't want to share. All right, so before I show you this information, I want you to think about, visualize, or if you're at home and can see this, where you store your medication, okay? So we're gonna talk about the do's and don'ts of medicine storage. You do wanna lock up medication that is at risk for being abused in a medicine safe. You can get a medicine safe at you know, a local drugstore. They're usually around 25 to $30. Um, you can keep medicine in a cool, dry place that is out of the reach of children. And you do want to store medicine in the original container. Now, I do want to caveat off that and say that if you have a pill organizer or something like that, that's fine. Just make sure that you keep the bottle. The reason for that is, is that label is going to tell you everything you need to know about the medication, the instructions, the dosage, who prescribed it so on and so forth. So just keep the bottle for that information purpose. And then also we wanna dispose of any unused or expired medication. And I will talk about that in just a couple slides. What we don't wanna do is we don't wanna leave medicine out where children can reach it. So places like nightstands, coffee tables, kitchen counters, that can all be dicey, depending on you know, how, the, how small the ch child is, so on and so forth. Um, so keeping it in a place where they can't reach it is going to be really important. It also says here, don't store medicine in the bathroom cabinet. Now, I know that might be new information for some of you. The reason for this is, is because of the heat and the moisture of the toilet, the sink, the shower, it can actually change the chemistry makeup in the medication. And so it's actually recommended that you don't store medicine in the bathroom because of that purpose. Um, and I know that sounds really strange because there's literally medicine cabinets that are built into the bathroom. Um, but it is recommended that a cool, dry place is really gonna be ideal. So what would be an example of that? 
Um, you could do a dresser, like a bedroom dresser. You could do a closet. You could do um, in your kitchen, as long as it's not above a, high, a hot appliance. You could even do like a kitchen cabinet or something like that. Somewhere that's not gonna be easily accessible to children, things like that. Also too, you don't wanna just have your medicine in the bathroom cabinet because if there are people coming over to your home, you never know who's snooping in your bathroom. So just some other recommendations and things um, for not storing your medicine in the bathroom. And then also something else is if you do need to take medicine, um, try to be mindful or careful about taking it in front of small children. I have a three-year-old daughter and there have been times where I've taken brightly colored medication. She thinks it looks like candy. She wants to do what mommy does. Same thing in a situation with a grandparent. They see grandma or grandpa taking a medication. They want to know what it is. They may be more interested. So just kind of a, a tip there. If you do have to take medication, maybe go into another room or if you can wait until they're not there. But just something to keep in mind, especially for the littles. <clears throat> Any questions about storage? I, I'm a little... Uh confused about storing medication in your bathroom. Okay. Um, my shower is in a separate room. I can close the door off. So there's no chance for humidity to be in there. So I'm, I'm thinking I'm safe to have it in the bathroom. Where the yeah. And, and I tell people too, because sometimes I'll have people say to me, oh, I have two bathrooms in my home and, you know, the guest bathroom, we don't really use that much. Sure. I mean, you can put medicine in there and if it's not a bathroom that's used a lot as far as the shower and the toilet and the sink, then then okay. The, the concern there too, though, is that if you have people coming over and if they're looking in your medicine cabinet, that could be where an issue lies. So, I mean, obviously everybody's situation is different. If you don't really have people coming over, then okay, that, that might not be a problem. But just, you know, thinking about that in a different way. Um, just know that if it is a bathroom that's used frequently, that there could be that risk. Does that make I sense? Yeah, thank you. You're Can welcome. Can I ask a question about that? I was just, so what could happen to the medicine? You mean the dosage wouldn't be any good? Or so, it, how, how do they determine that? And the medicine cabinets have been around for I don't know how long. Yeah. But I'm saying, when did they determine that um, that there was an issue with it? And what is it all medicines that that so it's not going to be as effective? And how would we know that? Yeah. So I don't know exactly like time frame when this information came out, um, but this is just information that over time, as they've done testing and things like that, that they've been able to determine. And okay. what might happen is medication chemistry might, uh, it might lessen the dosage. So if you think you're taking a certain milligram dosage, and yes. if it's been exposed to heat, um, it could lessen the dosage. So that can interfere or interact with medication. Right, also, it can down. cause the medication to expire quicker than okay. normal. All so right. those are some things that could happen. Yeah, yeah. great questions though. Um, and I do get asked two questions about storing in the refrigerator. Again, I would just make sure that you ask your pharmacist if that's okay, because I know some medications can and should be in the fridge, but I wouldn't say all of them should be in the fridge. So great questions. Anything else? Okay, so I'm going to move on. And Levi, if I'm low on time, please let me know because I'm not near a clock. Um, to be able to assess that. So uh, couple, oh, go ahead. 27 now, so. Okay, all right, I'll speed it up. Um, so as far as disposing of medication, so a couple things we can do. There are drop box locations in the community. Normally they look like a green box, sometimes they're blue, but um, a lot of police stations, substations, Select Walgreens and CVS actually have a drop box in their pharmacy. So if you are able to take it to a drop box location, then that is something that you could do to dispose of your medication. 
just know that they're not gonna take everything. Um, they can take things like pills, capsules, tablets, those kinds of things. They can actually take pet medication in the same forms. Um, but things like, you know, like sharps, needles, creams, inhalers, they're not gonna be able to take in a box like this. So if you have specific questions about disposal of those items, I would definitely reach out to your pharmacist. Also this website here, dumpthedrugsaz.org. If you go to that website, you can take a look by zip code to see which Dropbox is closest to you. Um, if you are unable to get to a Dropbox or just don't wanna go to a Dropbox, you can dispose at home. And what you would do is you would take something unpalatable, use coffee grounds, kitty litter, dirt, even just trash. You would mix the medication in that substance. You would seal it in like a Ziploc or a plastic bag or a container that has a lid. And then you would throw that in your household trash. It's recommended that medication is not flushed down the toilet, down the sink or down the garbage disposal. The reason for that is, is because the filtration systems can't necessarily get out those trace elements of the medication. And so it's recommended that medication not be flushed. Um, again, if you have questions about that, you can talk to your doctor because I have heard that there are certain medications where it's okay to do that. But I would just go off the recommendation to properly dispose in the trash if, if you are looking to dispose of medications. All right, so that is my presentation. Um, I'm happy to take questions if there are any questions. I do wanna highlight one more resource that we have here at the agency. This is a disposal envelope. We have these disposal envelopes that you can get one of these if you call our senior helpline. The disposal envelopes have the instructions inside, but you would take your medication, you would put it in the envelope, you would seal it up, and then you would be able to send this to be incinerated. So again, that phone number to call, 602, and I'll put it in the chat too, 602-264-4357. That's our senior helpline. And you can ask for a disposal envelope if you are wanting or needing one. All right, I put it in the chat too. Thank you. Oh, there we go. There you go. If anyone has any questions for Lauren, please do uh, unmute your mic and now's a great time to ask. 